ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجاهد في الله حق المجاهدة حتى أتاب اليقين فنصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إذا وأنتم مسلمون. Dear brothers and sisters, we begin with praise and gratitude. These are the days that we have to realize all of these fundamental core blessings that we live and breathe every day. And the lifestyle that is incumbent upon the one who realized that is a lifestyle of service, a lifestyle of building on morality in oneself and one's family and in one's society. This is what that's all about, to make things good. Our life has been made good. In this way we say Alhamdulillah. So we realize around us there is evil and there is corruption and there is darkness. So we seek the guidance and the forgiveness of the one whose light can extinguish all of the darkness. So we seek his guidance and we seek his forgiveness when we slip up. And we ask him to protect us from the evil around us. I bear witness that there is no deity and nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad the son of Abdullah was his final messenger and prophet and guide that he sent to mankind with a complete way of life. There is nothing missing from it. But we have to seek it out. We have to establish foundations based upon it. Oftentimes people use words because of the way they have heard it or because they've heard other people saying it, so they're repeating it. And it's important to understand what things mean. When we say Iman, some people have the idea that what Iman just simply means is something you believe in. It's much deeper than that. When we say faith, what does that mean? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Iman comes the root, it comes from a root, Hamza mean nun. Security, safety, peace, all of those things are coming from that. Iman is giving your soul security by the means of Billah, God, angels, prophets, revelation, preparing for the eventual death and what comes thereafter, and knowing that the divine plan and knowledge is superseding and overarching everything. By means of those things, you will secure your soul if indeed you are committed to them. And that's how some scholars talk about the difference between Islam and Iman. Islam, to openly say, I'm a Muslim, I believe in God, He's one, He sent the Quran to Prophet Muhammad, He's the final perfect prophet, and so. I will pray when the time comes because I know I should be praying. I will give some zakat. I will go along with the community fasting Ramadan because I'm Muslim. Iman is a level in which you become dedicated to those truths that are the essence of guidance and purpose and meaning. Also from the root is Amana. Amana, it means to be trustworthy. 
to be responsible. So the Prophet said, لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له. There is no real safety and security in true faith for the one who is not trustworthy and responsible. You're not a real believer if you don't feel responsible. For what? What am I responsible for? First and foremost, you are responsible for the soul that gives you your life, that you are conscious of, and the body that that soul is put in, and the interaction between the mind and the heart and the soul. You are responsible for that. You've been blessed with amazing miracles like sight. You are responsible for what you choose to spend your time looking at. You are responsible. And when we say responsible, your soul's eternal value and worth is hanging in the balance. Your ears, it is a miraculous thing how we are deciphering and understanding complex communication and sounds. You are responsible for what you spend time using those ears for. Your tongue, you are responsible for what you say and how you say it and how that affects the world around you. The Muslim feels responsible. It's not just that. We feel responsible for the room we live in, the clothes we've been given. Do I keep them clean? Do I take care of them? Or do I just throw them down on the ground and don't care? My home, do I take care of it? Do I respect it? My parents in that home, do I feel responsible towards them? I've been given a gift of people who were always there for me. When I was crying and whining and my diaper was dirty and I didn't have anything to eat and was stomach was growling, these people were always there taking care of me. Do I feel responsible for that? That's what faith is all about. That's what it means. I live in the neighborhood. I have people living on either side and the front and the back of me. I, feel, I should feel responsible for them and their well-being and how they're affected by me as the one that lives next to them. This is what it means to believe. This is what faith is all about. I go to school. I'm given an opportunity to learn, to grow. Do I feel responsible about using my intellectual acumen and my time to excel to the best of my capacity? Or do I not feel responsible and be lazy and put it off and don't care? And waste my time on things that would really not benefit me in the long scheme of things, in this life and eternity. I have a job, a business. I have to take care of that and those that work there as my colleagues, as my boss, as my employees. Do you feel responsible for this? That's the question you should ask yourself. So when the Prophet said, لا إيمان لما لا أمانة لا That carries deep, profound, comprehensive daily life meaning. There is no faith for one that does not feel responsible. We have this hall that they have agreed right now, the people who own this place we're sitting in, they have agreed that they will sell it, closing date January 22nd. We have a building being built right now, mashallah, all of the Shell and now some of the filling is there. Just how responsible do you feel for that? So let's take a look at what that really means to us in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Al imanu bid'un wa sab'una shu'ba. 
Faith is like 70 something parts, meaning a whole lot. It is comprised of a lot of things. is La ilaha illallah. The best and the highest of faith is to understand and promote the absolute truth of existence, which is there is no deity and nothing should be worshipped other than God alone, creator of the universe, the one and only. To know and understand that as a primary reality of who I am is the best of faith. So, and the lowest level of faith is to remove some harmful thing from the pathway where people are driving or riding or walking or whatever. Do I feel that responsibility even the small thing? And a certain level of shyness and faith and character, a level of shame, a concern for my character and how I affect people, how God is looking at me, how I fit into my claim that the Prophet is my blessed guide and leader. So if you look, he's saying that faith is about how responsible you feel for who you are and what you do. And one hadith he said, The best of faith is patience, fortitude, perseverance, easygoing attitude, tolerance, respect for other people. One is the internal about how I deal with the things that don't fit my personal desire in recognizing I am not God and I am simply a servant and a blessing of the will of God. This is what it's saying. Sabah. I will exert my effort to be in obedience to Allah because He created me and gave me everything and I want to get closer to Him and I want to get comfortable with that. That's a rigorous process, requires sabr to get there. When He has defined things that are harmful to me in this life and the hereafter and the society around me, I will avoid those things because He has prohibited it. Even though I will desire to do those things because the human mind and body is an animal seeking to take in worldly materialistic value and gain. And when things don't happen according to my plan, I will realize it is not my plan and the one plan that counts is that when I die, the planner is with me and I am with him. This is what it means. So I'll tell you a little bit about my own story and how I was blessed to live here. I walked into a mosque in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1999 and I didn't know what to do or what was going on but I had been reading a translation of the Quran for over a year and I knew I was a Muslim. So this beautiful man, the Mu'addin, Sheikh Ibrahim Kiyo, Allah Akhalu, with Tawul Amr of the Khayr, he welcomed me. He embraced me. He took me. He called me. He said, You'll be like my son. Very sweet man. And then he showed me they have an English library in the mosque. MashaAllah. Maybe like 200 books to choose from and look at and read. And after every salah, somebody would always read a hadith. Or, mashallah, one of, they didn't have an official imam at that point. But somebody would make some reflection on the ayat or something like this. And some people were trying to shield me from some of the other people. And so they would take me in and welcome me to their house and things like this. And, you know, try to help me grow. Without that mosque, and the way people were 
trying to help me, I would not be standing here today. I'm certain of that after studying many cases of people who came and left this religion. And so, the sacred place where people can cultivate that safety and security of soul through a connection to the divine truths and the people who hold them sacred. There's a certain level of sacredness to this place. When I went studying, I started at Islamic American University in Michigan in 2002, a few years later after that. I will be honest with you, I gained some knowledge in the classroom, to study some look on Aqidah and Sirah and some comparative fiqh uh, stuff. But, spending time with Sheikh Mustafa Tolba in the Musalla and Sheikh Abdul Saeed in the circle of development, I benefited much greater there into who I am and what I'm about. You can gain all the knowledge and have lots of information on Islam. Lots of Orientalists have a lot of knowledge, more than many Imams I've known. I've read some books about Orientalists, they have deep understanding of the religion. And they're not Muslim. And their life does not reflect that Iman, that safety and security of the soul, as it is truly connected to divine truth. So, I remember when we started our mod, whenever I started my job as an imam in Florida, in 2009, and a young man named Derek Pete, many others, but he used to come to the mosque, he was a convert, and he used to come to every class, and he would come to me and he would say, let's sit down, I want to learn some Arabic, let's sit down, I want you to teach me from a classical book. We started leading the youth program, we were teaching basketball things, mashallah. He's now a principal of the Islamic school, he finished his degree in Jordan in Arabic and Islamic studies. I helped find a place to send him over there through people I know in Egypt. He went to Egypt a little bit, but then the whole country fell apart and he moved to Jordan and finished there. Now he's in Arizona leading a nice Islamic school in Phoenix. But that mosque is the place where you go to develop this. And it has to be the right environment so that it will be natural for you. It has to be recognizing the innate disposition, what we call fitra, that everyone has and the level of spirituality that they're at. You can't start talking to this one like this one or this one like this one, or you'll lose them. So the famous ayah, of the Qur'an, it talks about how this is the place where we grow. And an example. Says, indeed, the first house of worship that was standardized for people to come together is that in Bakka, before it was known as Mecca. And it was a blessed place, Mubarak. And it was a place of guidance. That's what the mosque is supposed to be. Lindas. For the people, all of them. Not one ethnicity, not one culture. For all the people seeking spiritual growth and development. Not for only the real religious guys who have all these rules in their mind that they're trying to follow. But for everyone, one doesn't know too much, one's not even Muslim, you know what those guys are about? Everybody's welcome there, they feel comfort. And the Prophet was like this. So then it says, فِيهِ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ In it are clear signs. مَقَامُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَمَنْ دَخَلُهُ كَانَ آمِنًا The place of Abraham. Let's take a look. Why was that place made an example? It was founded by a man and his son. It's a family place. It was founded by someone 
who directly connected between the rational and the scientific and the spiritual and sacred. And then it was a place where they were going to call for people from the corners of the earth, from many different backgrounds, to come to gain guidance. That mosque was meant to be the center of our lives. Why do we know that? Because it's a qibla. We're praying towards it, meaning it's at the center of the life of all of the Muslims. It's something we have to revive in our ummah. We are being secularized, my dear brothers and sisters. Whoever entered it is safe and secure. Some scholars said, because of the spirituality and all of that, their soul is safe in the hereafter from punishment. But many scholars, most of them, they said no, because it's a sacred place that represents spiritual virtue, at the top of which for human beings is inna Allah ayyamu bil adl, justice. So even when the society gets very corrupt and messed up and backward and all these things, like what happened before the Prophet ﷺ received revelation and the Yemeni man from Zabib, he came in there trying to make a business deal and al as bin Wa'il, he said, I'll make a deal with you. This is the father of Amr al as And then the guy came back the next day, I'm looking for my price for my goods. He said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Straight jack the guy right there. Stole the stuff and then told him, Who are you? I am Al Asr al Wa'il, a great respected noble. That's how they looked at it. Just like some people look at certain people in our society as noble, and we know they're not noble. Because of this guidance, this light, this iman, this faith, this security and safety of soul and purpose. So then the next day, the guy came to. Jabal Abi Qais. It's like a mountain, like if you go outside, it's like right outside of where the Hajj al Aswad is. And he starts say, saying poetry about what this place is supposed to be and how he's being oppressed, and all of that. People came together and said, No, this is unacceptable. Many of them don't know for sure what happened, but look at this guy. It's a place, so the mosque is a place. Then no matter what's going wrong in society, people are safe and taken care of there. That's what it's about. I'm telling you from personal experience, without the mosque, I'll probably be somewhere doing something very different right now. I'm sure. You have to come to see this point if our ummah will ever come back. If Charlotte will ever be known for safety and security from a spiritual moral reference point. It is upon us to do this. So, we are responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for our families. And we feel responsible for the society in which we live and our role in it and how we affect things here. In order to preserve what was meant to be preserved. Preserve also another meaning of a man to be taken care of in security and safety. It is in this place in the mosque where these pillars of faith and what it means to you and how you grow in it and how it affects how you talk and walk and live and interact that is the best and primary place in which it was cultivated. And that's what we should realize as we plan the future of our community here in Northern Charlotte. <laughs>
there's the smooth and hustle or the hustle according to some scholars. There's a way to talk about things in what we call in English merely, solely, for the specific purpose or reason. And that is innama. So innama, something, something. Something is in this way. That's what it is. That's the best definition for it. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Those who have faith, safety and security in their soul's eternal well-being those are known by specific descri descriptions. They have put their faith and trust in Allah and His Messenger. And they do not doubt. They do not doubt about the truth that has been proven through miraculous history and revelation. They do not doubt about their role in it and what could be done if indeed they embraced it. Muslims nowadays are pessimists. Let's all be honest with ourselves. We're always looking for how it's not going to work out, how the, there's a big problem, how there's a big conspiracy theory, and you know, stuff for Allah, we just can't do it. It's the odds are against us, we're never going to get out of this thing. Allahu Akbar man hadha kalam. God is greater than that. Anything and everything is possible with true Iman. Safety, security in a connection with the divine truth that has the overarching maintaining control and effective uh, functional systemic engineering of everything. If we know this, it will all come true. What we know was said to become true by previous generations. So that is who a believer is. And then what do they do once they put their certainty and faith in Allah and His Messenger? Then they're ready to struggle and strive. وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْغَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They are ready to put themselves in a discomfort, in a situation of hardship. Because they know that this is pleasing and this is making way on the straight path in the divine contentment of their Creator. So they're going to put their time, spending time in the place and in the cause and in the defense of what is sacred. And they're going to spend their wealth and sacrifice their wealth for that. And when you look at the Prophet ﷺ's companions, you see it plain as day. That was the secret to their success in that what this verse says about them, they lived it to a teeth. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh, beloved guide, merciful, compassionate, redeemer, benevolent source of all truth and goodness, we ask you to inspire us and motivate us to be responsible. We ask you to make us trustworthy, responsible people who have an ethic that is about pleasing the divine. We ask you to make us a people of deep wisdom and understanding and a drive to struggle and strive for your cause. We ask you to make us a people who are truly worthy of your victory and of your support and of your help in all of our endeavors. We ask you to make us a people who are successful in establishing our community as individual Muslims representing you as families and as a Muslim community here at the Northern Charlotte community. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us an example for other places where people may not be connecting to you as you would have us do if we would simply follow this meaning that we find in the Quran and the Sunnah. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, for our doubts, for our laziness, for our weakness, for our lack of fortitude and perseverance. We ask you to make us a people 
of moral stability and upright character and people who would please you by following your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam